Section 1 of the Aeneid of Virgil. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aeneid of Virgil. Translated by John Dryden. Book 1, Part 1. Arms and the man I sing, who, forced by fate, and haughty Juno's unrelenting hate, expelled and exiled, left the Trojan shore, long labors both by sea and land he bore, and in the doubtful war before he won the Latian realm and built the destined town, his banished gods restored to rites divine, and settled sure succession in his line, from whence the race of Alban fathers come, and the long glories of majestic Rome. O muse, the causes and the crimes relate, what goddess was provoked, and whence her hate, for what offence the queen of heaven began, to persecute so brave, so just a man, involved his anxious life in endless cares, exposed to wants and hurried into wars. Can heavenly minds such high resentment show, or exercise their spite in human woe. Against the Tiber's mouth, but far away, an ancient town was seated on the sea, a Tyrian colony. The people made stout for the war and studious of their trade, Carthage the name, beloved by Juno more than her own Argos or the Samian shore. Here stood her chariot, here if heaven were kind, the seat of awful empire she designed, Yet she had heard an ancient rumour fly, long sighted by the people of the sky, that times to come should see the Trojan race, her Carthage ruin and her towers deface. Nor thus confined the yoke of sovereign sway should on the necks of all the nations lay. She pondered this, and feared it was in fate, nor could forget the war she waged of late, for conquering Greece against the Trojan state. Besides, long causes working in her mind, and secret seeds of envy lay behind, deep graven in her heart the doom remained, of partial Paris, and her form disdained. The grace bestowed on ravished Ganymede, Electra's glories, and her injured bed. Each was a cause alone, and all combined, to kindle vengeance in her haughty mind. For this, far distant from the Latian coast, she drove the remnants of the Trojan host, and seven long years the unhappy wandering train were tossed by storms and scattered through the main. Such time, such toil required the Roman name, such length of labor for so vast a frame. Now scarce the Trojan fleet, with sails and oars, had left behind the fair Sicilian shores, Entering with cheerful shouts the watery rain, and ploughing frothy furrows in the main, when, labouring still with endless discontent, the queen of heaven did thus her fury vent. Then am I vanquished, must I yield, said she, and must the Trojans reign in Italy. So fate will have it, and Jove adds his force, nor can my power divert their happy course. Could angry Pallas with revengeful spleen the Grecian navy burn and drown the men? She, for the fault of one offending foe, the bolts of Jove himself presumed to throw. With whirlwinds from beneath she tossed the ship, and bare exposed the bosom of the deep. Then as an eagle gripes the trembling game, the wretch yet hissing with her father's flame, she strongly seized, and with a burning wound transfixed and naked on a rock she bound. But I, who walk in awful state above, the majesty of heaven, the sister-wife of Jove, for length of years my fruitless force employ against the thin remains of ruined Troy. What nations now to Juno's power will pray, or offerings on my slighted altars lay? Thus raged the goddess, and with fury fraught the restless regions of the storms she sought, where in a spacious cave of living stone the tyrant Aeolus from his airy throne 
with power imperial curbs the struggling winds and sounding tempests in dark prisons binds this way and that the impatient captives tend and pressing for release the mountains rend high in his hall the undaunted monarch stands and shakes his sceptre and their rage commands which did he not their unresisted sway would sweep the world before them in their way earth air and seas through empty space would roll and heaven would fly before the driving soul in fear of this the father of the gods confined their fury to those dark abodes and locked him safe within oppressed with mountain loads imposed a king with arbitrary sway to loose their fetters or their force allay to whom the suppliant queen her prayers addressed and thus the tenor of her suit expressed o aeolus for to thee the king of heaven the power of tempests and of winds has given thy force alone their fury can restrain and smooth the waves or swell the troubled main a race of wandering slaves abhorred by me with prosperous passage cut the tuscan sea to fruitful italy their course they steer and for their vanquished gods design new temples there raise all thy winds with night involve the skies sink or disperse my fatal enemies twice seven the charming daughters of the main around my person wait and bear my train succeed my wish and second my design the fairest deopia shall be thine and make thee father of a happy line to this the god tis yours o queen to will the work which duty binds me to fulfil these airy kingdoms and this wide command are all the presence of your bounteous hand yours is my sovereign's grace and as your guest i sit with gods at their celestial feast raise tempests at your pleasure or subdue dispose of empire which i hold from you he said and hurled against the mountain side his quivering spear and all the god applied the raging winds thrush through the hollow wound and dance aloft in air and skim along the ground then settling on the sea the surges sweep raise liquid mountains and disclose the deep south east and west with mixed confusion roar and roll the foaming billows to the shore the cables crack the sailors fearful cries ascend and sable night involves the skies and heaven itself is ravished from their eyes loud peals of thunder from the poles ensue then flashing fires the transient light renew the face of things a frightful image bears and present death in various forms appears struck with unusual fright the trojan chief with lifted hands and eyes invokes relief and thrice and four times happy those he cried that under ilian walls before their parents died tydides bravest of the grecian train why could not i by that strong arm be slain and lie by noble hector on the plain or great sarpedon in those bloody fields where simois rolls the bodies and the shields of heroes whose dismembered hands yet bear that dart aloft and clinch the pointed spear thus while the pious prince his fate bewails fierce boreas strove against his flying sails and rent the sheets the raging billows rise and mount the tossing vessels to the skies nor can the shivering oars sustain the blow the galley gives her side and turns her prow while those astern descending down the steep through gaping waves behold the boiling deep three ships were hurried by the southern blast and on the secret shelves with fury cast those hidden rocks the ausonian sailors knew they called them altars when they rose in view and showed their spacious backs above the flood three more fierce eurus in his angry mood dashed on the shallows of the moving sand and in mid-ocean left them moored a land orontes bark that bore the lycian crew a horrid sight even in the hero's view from stem to stern by waves was overborne the trembling pilot from his rudder torn was headlong hurled thrice round the ship was tossed then bulged at once and in the deep was lost and here and there above the waves were seen arms pictures precious goods and floating men 
the stoutest vessel to the storm gave way and sucked through loosened planks the rushing sea ilioneus was her chief alethes old achates faithful abas young and bold endured not less their ships with gaping seams admit the deluge of the briny streams meantime imperial neptune heard the sound of raging billows breaking on the ground displeased and fearing for his watery reign he reared his awful head above the main serene in majesty then rolled his eyes around the space of earth and seas and skies he saw the trojan fleet dispersed distressed by stormy winds and wintry heaven oppressed full well the god his sister's envy knew and what her aims and what her arts pursue he summoned eurus and the western blast and first an angry glance on both he cast then thus rebuked audacious winds from whence this bold attempt this rebel insolence is it for you to ravage seas and land unauthorized by my supreme command to raise such mountains on the troubled main whom i but first tis fit the billows to restrain and then you shall be taught obedience to my reign hence to your lord my royal mandate bear the realms of ocean and the fields of air are mine not his by fatal lot to me the liquid empire fell and trident of the sea his power to hollow caverns is confined there let him reign the jailer of the wind with hoarse commands his breathing subjects call and boast and bluster in his empty hall he spoke and while he spoke he smoothed the sea dispelled the darkness and restored the day Kimothoe, triton and the sea-green train of beauteous nymphs the daughters of the main clear from the rocks the vessels with their hands the god himself with ready trident stands and opes the deep and spreads the moving sands then heaves them off the shoals where'er he guides his finny coursers and in triumph rides the waves unruffle and the sea subsides as when in tumults rise the ignoble crowd mad are their motions and their tongues are loud and stones and brands and rattling volleys fly and all the rustic arms that fury can supply if then some grave and pious man appear they hush their noise and lend a listening ear he soothes with sober words their angry mood and quenches their innate desire of blood so when the father of the flood appears and o'er the seas his sovereign trident rears their fury falls he skims the liquid plains high on his chariot and with loosened reins majestic moves along and awful peace maintains the weary trojans ply their shattered oars to nearest land and make the libyan shores within a long recess there lies a bay an island shades it from the rolling sea and forms a port secure for ships to ride broke by the jutting land on either side in double streams the briny waters glide betwixt two rows of rocks a sylvan scene appears above and groves forever green a grot is formed beneath with mossy seats to rest the nereids and exclude the heats down through the crannies of the living walls the crystal streams descend in murmuring falls no halsers need to bind the vessels here nor bearded anchors for no storms they fear seven ships within this happy harbour meet the thin remainders of the scattered fleet the trojans worn with toils and spent with woes leap on the welcome land and seek their wished repose first good achates with repeated strokes of clashing flints their hidden fire provokes short flame succeeds a bed of withered leaves the dying sparkles in their fall receives caught into life in fiery fumes they rise and fed with stronger food invade the skies the trojans dropping wet or stand around the cheerful blaze or lie along the ground some dry their corn infected with the brine then grind with marbles and prepare to dine aeneas climbs the mountain's airy brow and takes a prospect of the seas below if capis thence or antheus he could spy or see the streamers of caicus fly no vessels were in view but on the plain 
three beamy stags command a lordly train of branching heads the more ignoble throng attend their stately steps and slowly graze along he stood and while secure they fed below he took the quiver and the trusty bow Achates used to bear the leaders first he laid along and then the vulgar pierced nor ceased his arrows till the shady plain seven mighty bodies with their blood disdain for the seven ships he made an equal share and to the port returned triumphant from the war the jars of generous wine Achestes' gift when his trinacrian shores the navy left he set a brooch and for the feast prepared in equal portions with the venison shared thus while he dealt it round the pious chief with cheerful words allayed the common grief endure and conquer jove will soon dispose to future good our past and present woes with me the rocks of scylla you have tried the inhuman cyclops and his din defied what greater ills hereafter can you bear resume your courage and dismiss your care an hour will come with pleasure to relate your sorrows past as benefits of fate through various hazards and events we move to Lytium, and the realms foredoomed by Jove, called to the seat the promise of the skies, where Trojan kingdoms once again may rise, endure the hardships of your present state, live and reserve yourselves for better fate. These words he spoke, but spoke not from his heart, his outward smiles concealed his inward smart. The jolly crew, unmindful of the past, their quarry share, their plenteous dinner haste. Some strip the skin, some portion out the spoil, the limbs yet trembling in the cauldron's boil, some on the fire the reeking entrails broil. Stretched on the grassy turf, at ease they dine, restore their strength with meat, and cheer their souls with wine. Their hunger thus appeased, their care attends the doubtful fortune of their absent friends alternate hopes and fears their minds possess whether to deem em dead or in distress above the rest aeneas mourns the fate of brave orontes and the uncertain state of gaius lycus and of amicus the day but not their sorrows ended thus when from aloft almighty jove surveys earth air and shores and navigable seas at length on libyan realms he fixed his eyes whom pondering thus on human miseries when venus saw she with a lowly look not free from tears her heavenly sire bespoke o king of gods and men whose awful hand disperses thunder on the seas and land disposing all with absolute command how could my pious son thy power incense or what alas is vanished troy's offence our hope of italy not only lost on various seas by various tempests tossed but shut from every shore and barred from every coast you promised once a progeny divine of romans rising from the trojan line in after times should hold the world in awe and to the land and ocean give the law how is your doom reversed which eased my care when troy was ruined in that cruel war then fates to fates i could oppose but now when fortune still pursues her former blow what can i hope what worse can still succeed what end of labours has your will decreed antenor from the midst of grecian hosts could pass secure and pierce the illyrian coasts where rolling down the steep timavus raves and through nine channels disembogues his waves at length he founded padua's happy seat and gave his trojans a secure retreat there fixed their arms and there renewed their name and there in quiet rules and crowned with fame but we descended from your sacred line entitled to your heaven and rights divine our banished earth and for the wrath of one removed from latium and the promised throne are these our sceptres these our due rewards and is it thus that jove his plighted faith regards to whom the father of the immortal race smiling with that serene indulgent face with which he drives the clouds and clears the skies first gave a holy kiss then thus replies daughter dismiss thy fears to thy desire the fates of thine are fixed and stand entire 
Thou shalt behold thy wished Lavinian walls, And ripe for heaven when fate Aeneas calls, Then shalt thou bear him up sublime to me, No counsels have reversed my firm decree. And lest new fears disturb thy happy state, Know I have searched the mystic rolls of fate, Thy son, nor is the appointed season far, In Italy shall wage successful war, Shall tame fierce nations in the bloody field, And sovereign laws impose and cities build, Till, after every foe subdued, The sun thrice through the signs his annual race shall run, This is his time prefixed. Ascanius then, now called Iulus, shall begin his reign. He thirty rolling years the crown shall wear, then from Lavinium shall the seat transfer, and with hard labor Alba Longa build. The throne with his succession shall be filled three hundred circuits more. Then shall be seen Ilia the fair, a priestess and a queen, who, full of Mars in time with kindly throes, shall at a birth two goodly boys disclose. The royal babes a tawny wolf shall train. Then Romulus his grandsire's throne shall gain. Of martial towers the founder shall become. The people Romans call the city Rome. To them no bounds of empire I assign, nor term of years to their immortal line. Even haughty Juno, who with endless broils earth, seas, and heaven, and Jove himself turmoils, at length atoned, her friendly power shall join to cherish and advance the Trojan line. The subject world shall Rome's dominion own, and prostrate shall adore the nation of the gown. An age is ripening in revolving fate, when Troy shall overturn the Grecian state, and sweet revenge her conquering sons shall call, to crush the people that conspired her fall. Then Caesar from the Julian stock shall rise, whose empire ocean and whose fame the skies alone shall bound, whom fraught with eastern spoils our heaven, the just reward of human toils, securely shall repay with rites divine. And incense shall ascend before his sacred shrine, then dire debate and impious war shall cease, and the stern age be softened into peace. Then banished faith shall once again return, and vestal fires in hallowed temples burn, and Remus with Quirinus shall sustain the righteous laws, and fraud and force restrain. Janus himself before his fane shall wait, and keep the dreadful issues of his gate, with bolts and iron bars within remains, imprisoned fury bound in brazen chains, High on a trophy raised of useless arms, he sits and threats the world with vain alarms. He said and sent Cyllenius with command to free the ports and ope the Punic land to Trojan guests, lest, ignorant of fate, the queen might force them from her town and state. Down from the steep of heaven Cyllenius flies and cleaves with all his wings the yielding skies. Soon on the Libyan shore descends the god, Performs his message, and displays his rod. The surly murmurs of the people cease, And as the fates required, they give the peace. The queen herself suspends the rigid laws, The Trojans pities, and protects their cause. Meantime, in shades of night, Aeneas lies. Care seized his soul, and sleep forsook his eyes. But when the sun restored the cheerful day, he rose the coast and country to survey, anxious and eager to discover more, it looked a wild, uncultivated shore. But whether humankind or beasts alone possessed the new-found region was unknown. Beneath a ledge of rocks his fleet he hides. Tall trees surround the mountain's shady sides, the bending brow above a safe retreat provides. Armed with two pointed darts, he leaves his friends, and true Achates on his steps attends. Lo, in the deep recesses of the wood, before his eyes his goddess mother stood, a huntress in her habit and her mien, her dress a maid, her air confessed a queen. 
bare were her knees and knots her garments bind loose was her hair and wantoned in the wind her hand sustained a bow her quiver hung behind she seemed a virgin of the spartan blood with such array harpalis bestrode her thracian courser and outstripped the rapid flood ho oh, strangers have you lately seen she said one of my sisters like myself arrayed who crossed the lawn or in the forest strayed a painted quiver at her back she bore varied with spots a lynx's hide she wore and at full cry pursued the tusky boar thus venus thus her son replied again none of your sisters have we heard or seen o virgin or what other name you bear above that style o more than mortal fair your voice and mien celestial birth betray if as you seem the sister of the day or one at least of chaste diana's train let not an humble suppliant sue in vain but tell a stranger long in tempests tossed what earth we tread and who commands the coast then on your name shall wretched mortals call and offered victims at your altars fall i dare not she replied assume the name of goddess or celestial honours claim for tyrian virgins bows and quivers bear and purple buskins o'er their ankles wear no gentle youth in libyan lands you are a people rude in peace and rough in war the rising city which from far you see is carthage and a tyrian colony phoenician dido rules the growing state who fled from tyre to shun her brother's hate great were her wrongs her story full of fate which i will sum in short Sicaeus, known for wealth and brother to the punic throne possessed fair dido's bed and either heart at once was wounded with an equal dart her father gave her yet a spotless maid pygmalion then the tyrian sceptre swayed one who condemned divine and human laws then strife ensued and cursed gold the cause the monarch blinded with desire of wealth with steel invades his brother's life by stealth before the sacred altar made him bleed and long from her concealed the cruel deed some tale some new pretence he daily coined to soothe his sister and delude her mind at length in dead of night the ghost appears of her unhappy lord the spectre stares and with erected eyes his bloody bosom bears the cruel altars and his fate he tells and the dire secret of his house reveals then warns the widow with her household gods to seek a refuge in remote abodes last to support her in so long a way he shows her where his hidden treasure lay admonished thus and seized with mortal fright the queen provides companions of her flight they meet and all combine to leave the state who hate the tyrant or who fear his hate they seize a fleet which ready rigged they find nor is pygmalion's treasure left behind the vessels heavy laden put to sea with prosperous winds a woman leads the way i know not if by stress of weather driven or was their fatal course disposed by heaven at last they landed where from far your eyes may view the turrets of new carthage rise there bought a space of ground which Birsa called from the bull's hide they first enclosed and walled but whence are you what country claims your birth what seek you strangers on our libyan earth to whom with sorrow streaming from his eyes and deeply sighing thus her son replies could you with patience hear or i relate o nymph the tedious annals of our fate through such a train of woes if i should run the day would sooner than the tale be done from ancient troy by force expelled we came if you by chance have heard the trojan name on various seas by various tempests tossed at length we landed on your libyan coast the good aeneas am i called a name while fortune favoured not unknown to fame my household gods companions of my woes with pious care i rescued from our foes to fruitful italy my course was bent and from the king of heaven is my descent 
with twice ten sail i crossed the phrygian sea fate and my mother goddess led my way scarce seven the thin remainders of my fleet from storms preserved within your harbour meet myself distressed an exile and unknown debarred from europe and from asia thrown in libyan deserts wander thus alone end of section one section two of the aeneid of virgil this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book One, Part Two. His tender parent could no longer bear, but interposing sought to soothe his care. Whoe'er you are, not unbeloved by heaven, since on our friendly shore your ships are driven, have courage, to the gods permit the rest, and to the queen expose your just request now take this earnest of success for more your scattered fleet is joined upon the shore the winds are changed your friends from danger free or i renounce my skill in augury twelve swans behold in beauteous order move and stoop with closing pinions from above whom late the bird of jove had driven along and through the clouds pursued the scattering throng now all united in a goodly team they skim the ground and seek the quiet stream as they with joy returning clap their wings and ride the circuit of the skies in rings not otherwise your ships and every friend already hold the port or with swift sails descend no more advice is needful but pursue the path before you and the town in view thus having said she turned and made appear her neck refulgent and dishevelled hair which flowing from her shoulders reached the ground and widely spread ambrosial scents around in length of train descends her sweeping gown and by her graceful walk the queen of love is known the prince pursued the parting deity with words like these ah whither do you fly unkind and cruel to deceive your son in borrowed shapes and his embraced shun never to bless my sight but thus unknown and still to speak in accents not your own against the goddess these complaints he made but took the path and her commands obeyed they march obscure for venus kindly shrouds with mists their persons and involves in clouds that thus unseen their passage none might stay or force to tell the causes of their way this part performed the goddess flies sublime to visit paphos and her native clime where garlands ever green and ever fair with vows are offered and with solemn prayer a hundred altars in her temples smoke a thousand bleeding hearts her power invoke they climb the next ascent and looking down now at a nearer distance view the town the prince with wonder sees the stately towers which late were huts and shepherds homely bowers the gates and streets and hears from every part the noise and busy concourse of the mart the toiling tyrians on each other call to ply their labour some extend the wall some build the citadel the brawny throng or dig or push unwieldy stones along some for their dwellings choose a spot of ground which first designed with ditches they surround some laws ordain and some attend the choice of holy senates and elect by voice here some design a mole while others there lay deep foundations for a theatre from marble quarries mighty columns hew for ornaments of scenes and future view such is their toil and such their busy pains as exercise the bees in flowery plains when winter past and summer scarce begun invites them forth to labour in the sun some lead their youth abroad while some condense their liquid store and some in cells dispense some at the gate stand ready to receive the golden burthen and their friends relieve all with united force combine to drive the lazy drones from the laborious hive with envy stung they view each other's deeds the fragrant work with diligence proceeds thrice happy you whose walls already rise aeneas said and viewed with lifted eyes their lofty towers then entering at the gate 
concealed in clouds prodigious to relate he mixed unmarked among the busy throng borne by the tide and passed unseen along full in the centre of the town there stood thick set with trees a venerable wood the tyrians landing near this holy ground and digging here a prosperous omen found from under earth a courser's head they drew their growth and future fortune to foreshow this fated sign their foundress juno gave of a soil fruitful and a people brave sidonian dido here with solemn state did juno's temple build and consecrate enriched with gifts and with a golden shrine but more the goddess made the place divine on brazen steps the marble threshold rose and brazen plates the cedar beams enclose the rafters are with brazen coverings crowned the lofty doors on brazen hinges sound what first aeneas this place beheld revived his courage and his fear expelled for a while expecting there the queen he raised his wondering eyes and round the temple gazed admired the fortune of the rising town the striving artists and their arts renown he saw in order painted on the wall whatever did unhappy troy befall the wars that fame around the world had blown all to the life and every leader known there agamemnon priam here he spies and fierce achilles who both kings defies he stopped and weeping said o oh, friend even here the monuments of trojan woes appear our known disasters fill even foreign lands see there where old unhappy priam stands even the mute walls relate the warrior's fame and trojan griefs the tyrian's pity claim he said his tears a ready passage find devouring what he saw so well designed and with an empty picture fed his mind for there he saw the fainting grecians yield and here the trembling trojans quit the field pursued by fierce achilles through the plain on his high chariot driving o'er the slain the tents of rhesus next his grief renew by their white sails betray to nightly view and wakeful diomede whose cruel sword the sentries slew nor spared their slumbering lord then took the fiery steeds ere yet the food of troy they taste or drink the xanthian flood elsewhere he saw where troilus defied achilles and unequal combat tried then where the boy disarmed with loosened reins was by his horses hurried o'er the plains hung by the neck and hair and dragged around the hostile spear yet sticking in his wound with tracks of blood inscribed the dusty ground meantime the trojan dames oppressed with woe to pallas fain in long procession go in hopes to reconcile their heavenly foe they weep they beat their breasts they rend their hair and rich embroidered vests for presents bear but the stern goddess stands unmoved with prayer thrice round the trojan walls achilles drew the corpse of hector whom in fight he slew here priam sues and there for sums of gold the lifeless body of his son is sold so sad an object and so well expressed drew sighs and groans from the grieved hero's breast to see the figure of his lifeless friend and his old sire his helpless hand extend himself he saw amidst the grecian train mixed in the bloody battle on the plain and swarthy memnon in his arms he knew his pompous incense and his indian crew penthesilea there with haughty grace leads to the wars an amazonian race in their right hands a pointed dart they wield the left for ward sustains the lunar shield athwart her breast a golden belt she throws amidst the press alone provokes a thousand foes and dares her maiden arms to manly force oppose thus while the trojan prince employs his eyes fixed on the walls with wonder and surprise the beauteous dido with a numerous train and pomp of guards ascends the sacred fane such on eurotas banks or kynthos height 
Diana seems, and so she charms the sight, when in the dance the graceful goddess leads the choir of nymphs and overtops their heads, known by her quiver and her lofty mien, she walks majestic and she looks their queen. Latona sees her shine above the rest and feeds with secret joy her silent breast. Such Dido was, with such becoming state, amidst the crowd, she walks serenely great. Their labor to her future sway she speeds, and passing with a gracious glance proceeds. Then mounts the throne, high placed before the shrine, in crowds around the swarming people join. She takes petitions and dispenses laws, hears and determines every private cause, their tasks in equal portions she divides, and, where unequal, there by lots decides. Another way by chance Aeneas bends his eyes, and unexpected sees his friends, Antheus, Sergestus grave, Cloanthus strong, and at their backs a mighty Trojan throng, whom late the tempest on the billows tossed, and widely scattered on another coast. The prince, unseen, surprised with wonder, stands, and longs with joyful haste to join their hands. But, doubtful of the wished event, he stays, and from the hollow cloud his friends surveys, impatient till they told their present state, and where they left their ships, and what their fate, and why they came, and what was their request. For these were sent, commissioned by the rest, to sue for leave to land their sickly men, and gain admission to the gracious queen. Entering with cries they filled the holy fane, then thus, with lowly voice, Ileoneus began. O queen, indulged by favor of the gods, to found an empire in these new abodes, to build a town, with statutes to restrain the wild inhabitants beneath thy reign, we wretched Trojans, tossed on every shore, from sea to sea, thy clemency implore. Forbid the fires our shipping to deface. Receive the unhappy fugitives to grace, and spare the remnant of a pious race. We come not with design of wasteful prey, to drive the country, force the swains away, nor such our strength, nor such is our desire. The vanquished dare not to such thoughts aspire. A land there is, Hesperia named of old, the soil is fruitful and the men are bold. The Enotrians held it once, by common fame, now called Italia from the leader's name. To that sweet region was our voyage bent, when winds and every warring element disturbed our course, and far from sight of land cast our torn vessels on the moving sand. The sea came on, the south with mighty roar, dispersed and dashed the rest upon the rocky shore those few you see escaped the storm and fear unless you interpose a shipwreck here what men what monsters what inhuman race what laws what barbarous customs of the place shut up a desert shore to drowning men and drive us to the cruel seas again if our hard fortune no compassion draws nor hospitable rights nor human laws the gods are just and will revenge our cause aeneas was our prince a juster lord or nobler warrior never drew a sword observant of the right religious of his word if yet he lives and draws this vital air nor we his friends of safety shall despair nor you great queen these offices repent which he will equal and perhaps augment. We want not cities, nor Sicilian coasts, where King Acestes' Trojan lineage boasts. Permit our ships a shelter on your shores, refitted from your woods with planks and oars, that, if our prince be safe, we may renew our destined course, and Italy pursue. But if, O best of men, the fates ordain that thou art swallowed in the Libyan main, and if our young Eulus be no more, dismiss our navy from your friendly shore, that we to good Acestes may return, and with our friends our common losses mourn. Thus spoke Ilioneus. The Trojan crew, with cries and clamours, his request renew. 
the modest queen a while with downcast eyes pondered the speech then briefly thus replies trojans dismiss your fears my cruel fate and doubts attending an unsettled state force me to guard my coast from foreign foes who has not heard the story of your woes the name and fortune of your native place the fame and valor of the phrygian race we tyrians are not so devoid of sense nor so remote from phoebus influence whether to latian shores your course is bent or driven by tempests from your first intent you seek the good acestes government your men shall be received your fleet repaired and sail with ships of convoy for your guard or would you stay and join your friendly powers to raise and to defend the tyrian towers my wealth my city and myself are yours and would to heaven the storm you felt would bring on carthaginian coasts your wandering king my people shall by my command explore the ports and creeks of every winding shore and towns and wilds and shady woods in quest of so renowned and so desired a guest raised in his mind the trojan hero stood and longed to break from out his ambient cloud achates found it and thus urged his way from whence o goddess born this long delay what more can you desire your welcome sure your fleet in safety and your friends secure one only wants and him we saw in vain oppose the storm and swallowed in the main orontes in his fate our forfeit paid the rest agrees with what your mother said scarce had he spoken when the cloud gave way the mists flew upward and dissolved in day the trojan chief appeared in open sight august in visage and serenely bright his mother goddess with her hands divine had formed his curling locks and made his temples shine and given his rolling eyes a sparkling grace and breathed a youthful vigor on his face like polished ivory beauteous to behold or parian marble when enchased in gold thus radiant from the circling cloud he broke and thus with manly modesty he spoke he whom you seek am i by tempest tossed and saved from shipwreck on your libyan coast presenting gracious queen before your throne a prince that owes his life to you alone fair majesty the refuge and redress of those whom fate pursues and wants oppress you who your pious offices employ to save the relics of abandoned troy receive the shipwrecked on your friendly shore with hospitable rites relieve the poor associate in your town a wandering train and strangers in your palace entertain what thanks can wretched fugitives return who scattered through the world in exile mourn the gods if gods to goodness are inclined if acts of mercy touch their heavenly mind and more than all the gods your generous heart conscious of worth requite its own desert in you this age is happy and this earth and parents more than mortal gave you birth while rolling rivers into seas shall run and round the space of heaven the radiant sun while trees the mountain tops with shade supply your honor name and praise shall never die whate'er abode my fortune has assigned your image shall be present in my mind thus having said he turned with pious haste and joyful his expecting friends embraced with his right hand ilionius was graced serestes with his left then to his breast cloanthus and the noble gaius pressed and so by turns descended to the rest the tyrian queen stood fixed upon his face pleased with his motions ravished with his grace admired his fortunes more admired the man then recollected stood and thus began what fate o goddess born what angry powers have cast you shipwrecked on our barren shores are you the great aeneas known to fame who from celestial seed your lineage claim the same aeneas whom fair venus bore to famed anchises on the idaean shore it calls into my mind though then a child 
when Teucer came, from Salamis exiled, and sought my father's aid to be restored. My father, Belus, then with fire and sword, invaded Cyprus, made the region bare, and, conquering, finished the successful war. From him the Trojan siege I understood, the Grecian chiefs, and your illustrious blood. Your foe himself the Dardan valor praised, and his own ancestry from Trojans raised. Enter, my noble guest, and you shall find, if not a costly welcome, yet a kind. For I myself, like you, have been distressed, till heaven afforded me this place of rest. Like you, an alien in a land unknown, I learn to pity woes so like my own. She said, and to the palace led her guest, then offered incense and proclaimed a feast, nor yet less careful for her absent friends, twice ten fat oxen to the ships she sends, besides a hundred boars, a hundred lambs, with bleating cries attend their milky dams, and jars of generous wine and spacious bowls she gives to cheer the sailors' drooping souls. Now purple hangings clothe the palace walls, and sumptuous feasts are made in splendid halls. On Tyrian carpets richly wrought they dine, with loads of massy plate the sideboards shine, and antique vases all of gold embossed, the gold itself inferior to the cost of curious work, where on the sides were seen the fights and figures of illustrious men, from their first founder to the present queen. The good Aeneas' paternal care, Iulus' absence could no longer bear, dispatched Achates to the ships in haste, to give a glad relation of the past, and, fraught with precious gifts to bring the boy, snatched from the ruins of unhappy Troy, a robe of tissue, stiff with golden wire, an upper vest, once Helen's rich attire. From Argos, by the famed adulteress brought, with golden flowers and winding foliage wrought, her mother led us present, when she came to ruin Troy and set the world on flame. The scepter Priam's eldest daughter bore, her orient necklace, and the crown she wore, of double texture, glorious to behold, one order set with gems, and one with gold. Instructed thus, the wise Achates goes, and in his diligence his duty shows. But Venus, anxious for her son's affairs, new counsels tries, and new designs prepares, that Cupid should assume the shape and face of sweet Ascanius, and the sprightly grace should bring the presence in her nephew's stead, and in Eliza's veins the gentle poison shed, for much she feared the Tyrians double-tongued, and knew the town to Juno's care belonged. These thoughts by night her golden slumbers broke, and thus alarmed to winged love she spoke. My son, my strength, whose mighty power alone controls the thunder on his awful throne, to thee thy much afflicted mother flies, and on thy succor and thy faith relies. Thou knowest, my son, how Jove's revengeful wife by force and fraud attempts thy brother's life, and often hast thou mourned with me his pains. Him Dido now with blandishment detains, but I suspect the town where Juno reigns. For this tis needful to prevent her art, and fire with love the proud Phoenician's heart, a love so violent, so strong, so sure, as neither age can change nor art can cure. How this may be performed now take my mind. Ascanius by his father is designed to come with presents laden from the port, to gratify the queen and gain the court. I mean to plunge the boy in pleasing sleep, and, ravished in Idalian bowers to keep, or high Cythera, that the sweet deceit may pass unseen, and none prevent the cheat. Take thou his form and shape. I beg the grace, but only for a night's revolving space. Thyself a boy, assume a boy's dissembled face, that when, amidst the fervour of the feast, the Tyrian hugs and fawns thee on her breast, and with sweet kisses in her arms constrains, thou mayst infuse thy venom in her veins. The god of love obeys, and sets aside his bow and quiver, and his plumy pride, 
he walks Aeolus in his mother's sight, and in the sweet resemblance takes delight. The goddess then to young Ascanius flies, and in a pleasing slumber seals his eyes. Lulled in her lap amidst a train of loves, she gently bears him to her blissful groves. Then with a wreath of myrtle crowns his head, and softly lays him on a flowery bed. Cupid, meantime, assumed his form and face, following Achates with a shorter pace, and brought the gifts. The queen already sate amidst the Trojan lords in shining state, high on a golden bed. Her princely guest was next her side, in order set the rest. Then canisters with bread are heaped on high, the attendants water for their hands supply, and having washed with silken towels dry, next fifty handmaids in long order bore the censers, and with fumes the gods adore, then youths and virgins twice as many join to place the dishes and to serve the wine. The Tyrian train admitted to the feast approach, and on the painted couches rest. All on the Trojan gifts with wonder gaze, but view the beauteous boy with more amaze, his rosy-colored cheeks, his radiant eyes, his motions, voice, and shape, and all the gods disguise, nor pass unpraised the vest and veil divine, which wandering foliage and rich flowers entwine. But far above the rest the royal dame, already doomed to love's disastrous flame, with eyes insatiate and tumultuous joy, beholds the presence and admires the boy. The guileful god about the hero long with children's play and false embraces hung. Then sought the queen. She took him to her arms with greedy pleasure and devoured his charms. Unhappy Dido little thought what guest how dire a god she drew so near her breast. But he, not mindless of his mother's prayer, works in the pliant bosom of the fair, and moulds her heart anew, and blots her former care. The dead is to the living love resigned, and all Aeneas enters in her mind. Now when the rage of hunger was appeased, the meat removed, and every guest was pleased, the golden bowls with sparkling wine are crowned, and through the palace cheerful cries resound. From gilded roofs depending lamps display nocturnal beams that emulate the day. A golden bowl that shone with gems divine, the queen commanded to be crowned with wine. The bowl that Belus used, and all the Tyrian line. Then silence through the hall proclaimed, she spoke. O hospitable Jove, we thus invoke with solemn rites thy sacred name and power, Bless to both nations this auspicious hour. So may the Trojan and the Tyrian line In lasting concord from this day combine. Thou, Bacchus, god of joys and friendly cheer, And gracious Juno, both be present here. And you, my lords of Tyre, your vows address To heaven with mine to ratify the peace. The goblet then she took with nectar crowned, sprinkling the first libations on the ground, and raised it to her mouth with sober grace, then sipping offered the next in place. Twas Bitius whom she called a thirsty soul. He took challenge and embraced the bowl, with pleasure swilled the gold, nor ceased to draw, till he the bottom of the brimmer saw. The goblet goes around, Eopas brought his golden lyre, and sung what ancient Atlas taught, the various labors of the wandering moon, and whence proceed the eclipses of the sun, the original of men and beasts, and whence the rains arise, and fires their warmth dispense, and fixed and erring stars dispose their influence, what shakes the solid earth, what cause delays the summer nights, and shortens winter days, with peals of shouts the Tyrians praise the song. Those peals are echoed by the Trojan throng. The unhappy queen with talk prolonged the night, and drank large draughts of love with vast delight. Of Priam much inquired, of Hector more, then asked what arms the swarthy Memnon wore, what troops he landed on the Trojan shore. The steeds of Diomede varied the discourse, and fierce Achilles with his matchless force, 
at length as fate and her ill stars required to hear the series of the war desired relate at large my godlike guest she said the grecian stratagems the town betrayed the fatal issue of so long a war your flight your wanderings and your woes declare for since on every sea on every coast your men have been distressed your navy tossed seven times the sun has either tropic viewed the winter banished and the spring renewed end of section two section three of the aeneid of virgil this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Aeneid of Virgil Translated by John Dryden Book Two, Part One All were attentive to the godlike man, when from his lofty couch he thus began. Great Queen, what you command me to relate, renews the sad remembrance of our fate. An empire from its old foundations rent, and every woe the Trojans underwent. A peopled city made a desert place, all that I saw and part of which I was, not even the hardest of our foes could hear, nor stern Ulysses tell without a tear. And now the latter watch of wasting night and setting stars to kindly rest invite. But since you take such interest in our woe, and Troy's disastrous end desire to know. I will restrain my tears, and briefly tell what in our last and fatal night befell. By destiny compelled, and in despair, the Greeks grew weary of the tedious war, and by Minerva's aid a fabric reared, which like a steed of monstrous height appeared. The sides were planked with pine, they feigned it made for their return, and this the vow they paid. Thus they pretend, but in the hollow side selected numbers of their soldiers hide. With inward arms the dire machine they load, and iron bowels stuff the dark abode. In sight of Troy lies Tenedos, an isle, while fortune did on Priam's empire smile, renowned for wealth but since a faithless bay where ships exposed to wind and weather lay there was their fleet concealed we thought for greece their sails were hoisted and our fears release the trojans cooped within their walls so long unbar their gates and issue in a throng like swarming bees and with delight survey the camp deserted where the grecians lay the quarters of the several chiefs they showed here phoenix here achilles made abode here joined the battles there the navy rode part on the pile their wandering eyes employ the pile by pallas raised to ruin troy Thymetus first tis doubtful whether hired or so the trojan destiny required moved that the ramparts might be broken down to lodge the monster fabric in the town but Capis and the rest of sounder mind the fatal present to the flames designed or to the watery deep at least to bore the hollow sides and hidden frauds explore the giddy vulgar as their fancies guide with noise say nothing and in parts divide laocon followed by a numerous crowd ran from the fort and cried from far aloud o wretched countrymen what fury reigns what more than madness has possessed your brains think you the grecians from your coasts are gone and are ulysses arts no better known this hollow fabric must either enclose within its blind recess our secret foes or tis an engine raised above the town to o'erlook the walls and then to batter down somewhat is sure designed by fraud or force Trust not their presence, nor admit the horse. Thus having said, against the steed he threw his forceful spear, which, hissing as flew,
pierced through the yielding planks of jointed wood and trembling in the hollow belly stood the sides transpierced return a rattling sound and groans of greeks enclosed come issuing through the wound and had not heaven the fall of troy designed or had not men been fated to be blind enough was said and done to inspire a better mind then had our lances pierced the treacherous wood and ilian towers and priam's empire stood meantime with shouts the trojan shepherds bring a captive greek in bands before the king taken to take who made himself their prey to impose on their belief and troy betray fixed on his aim and obstinately bent to die undaunted or to circumvent about the captive tides of trojans flow all press to see and some insult the foe now hear how well the greeks their wiles disguised behold a nation in a man comprised trembling the miscreant stood unarmed and bound he stared and rolled his haggard eyes around then said alas what earth remains what sea is open to receive unhappy me what fate a wretched fugitive attends scorned by my foes abandoned by my friends he said and sighed and cast a rueful eye our pity kindles and our passions die we cheer youth to make his own defence and freely tell us what he was and whence what news he could impart we long to know and what to credit from a captive foe his fear at length dismissed he said whate'er my fate ordains my words shall be sincere i neither can nor dare my birth disclaim greece is my country sinon is my name though plunged by fortune's power in misery tis not in fortune's power to make me lie if any chance has hither brought the name of palamedes not unknown to fame who suffered from the malice of the times accused and sentenced for pretended crimes because these fatal wars he would prevent whose death the wretched greeks too late lament me then a boy my father poor and bare of other means committed to his care his kinsman and companion in the war while fortune favoured while his arms support the cause and ruled the councils of the court i made some figure there nor was my name obscure nor i without my share of fame but when ulysses with fallacious arts had made impression in the people's hearts and forged a treason in my patron's name i speak of things too far divulged by fame my kinsman fell then i without support in private mourned his loss and left the court mad as i was i could not bear his fate with silent grief but loudly blamed the state and cursed the direful author of my woes twas told again and hence my ruin rose i threatened if indulgent heaven once more would land me safely on my native shore his death with double vengeance to restore this moved the murderer's hate and soon ensued the effects of malice from a man so proud ambiguous rumours through the camp he spread and sought by treason my devoted head new crimes invented left unturned no stone to make my guilt appear and hide his own till calchas was by force and threatening wrought but why why dwell i on that anxious thought if on my nation just revenge you seek and tis to appear a foe to appear a greek already you my name and country know assuage your thirst of blood and strike the blow my death will both the kingly brothers please and set insatiate ithacus at ease this fair unfinished tale these broken starts raised expectations in our longing hearts unknowing as we were in grecian arts his former trembling once again renewed with acted fear the villain thus pursued long had the grecians tired with fruitless care and wearied with an unsuccessful war resolved to raise the siege and leave the town and had the gods permitted they had gone but oft the wintry seas and southern winds withstood their passage home and changed their minds portents and prodigies their souls amazed 
but most when this stupendous pile was raised then flaming meteors hung in air were seen and thunders rattled through a sky serene dismayed and fearful of some dire event eurypylus to inquire their fate was sent he from the gods this dreadful answer brought o grecians when the trojan shores you sought your passage with a virgin's blood was bought so must your safe return be bought again and grecian blood once more atone the main the spreading rumour round the people ran all feared and each believed himself the man ulysses took the advantage of their fright called calchas and produced in open sight then bade him name the wretch ordained by fate the public victim to redeem the state already some presaged the dire event and saw what sacrifice ulysses meant for twice five days the good old seer withstood the intended treason and was dumb to blood till tired with endless clamours and pursuit of ithacus he stood no longer mute but as it was agreed pronounced that i was destined by the wrathful gods to die all praised the sentence pleased the storm should fall on one alone whose fury threatened all the dismal day was come the priests prepare their leavened cakes and fillets for my hair i followed nature's laws and must avow i broke my bonds and fled the fatal blow hid in a weedy lake all night i lay secure of safety when they sailed away but now what further hopes for me remain to see my friends or native soil again my tender infants or my careful sire whom they returning will to death require will perpetrate on them their first design and take the forfeit of their heads for mine which oh if pity mortal minds can move if there be faith below or gods above if innocence and truth can claim desert ye trojans from an injured wretch avert false tears true pity move the king commands to loose his fetters and unbind his hands then adds these friendly words dismiss thy fears forget the greeks be mine as thou wert theirs but truly tell was it for force or guile or some religious end you raised the pile thus said the king he full of fraudful arts this well-invented tale for truth imparts ye lamps of heaven he said and lifted high his hands now free thou venerable sky inviolable powers adored with dread ye fatal fillets that once bound this head ye sacred altars from whose flames i fled be all of you adjured and grant i may without a crime the ungrateful greeks betray reveal the secrets of the guilty state and justly punish whom i justly hate but you o king preserve the faith you gave if i to save myself your empire save the grecian hopes and all the attempts they made were only founded on minerva's aid but from the time when impious diomed and false ulysses that inventive head her fatal image from the temple drew the sleeping guardians of the castle slew her virgin statue with their bloody hands polluted and profaned her holy bands from thence the tide of fortune left their shore and ebbed much faster than it flowed before their courage languished as their hopes decayed and pallas now averse refused her aid nor did the goddess doubtfully declare her altered mind and alienated care when first her fatal image touched the ground she sternly cast her glaring eyes around that sparkled as they rolled and seemed to threat her heavenly limbs to still the briny sweat thrice from the ground she leaped was seen to wield her brandished lance and shake her horrid shield then calchas bade our host for flight and hope no conquest from the tedious war till first they sailed for greece with prayers besought her injured power and better omens brought and now their navy ploughs the watery main yet soon expect it on your shores again with pallas pleased as calchas did ordain but first to reconcile the blue-eyed maid for her stolen statue and her tower betrayed warned by the seer to her offended name we raised and dedicate this wondrous frame 
so lofty lest through your forbidden gates it pass and intercept our better fates for once admitted there our hopes are lost and troy may then a new palladium boast for so religion and the gods ordain that if you violate with hands profane minerva's gift your town in flames shall burn which omen o ye gods on grecia turn but if it climb with your assisting hands the trojan walls and in the city stands then troy shall argos and mycenae burn and the reverse of fate on us return with such deceits he gained their easy hearts too prone to credit his perfidious arts what diomede nor thetis greater son a thousand ships nor ten years siege had done false tears and fawning words the city won a greater omen and of worse portent did our unwary minds with fear torment concurring to produce the dire event laocoon neptune's priest by lot that year with solemn pomp then sacrificed a steer when dreadful to behold from sea we spied two serpents ranked abreast the seas divide and smoothly sweep along the swelling tide their flaming crests above the waves they show their bellies seem to burn the seas below their speckled tails advance to steer their course and on the sounding shore the flying billows force and now the strand and now the plain they held their ardent eyes with bloody streaks were filled their nimble tongues they brandished as they came and licked their hissing jaws that sputtered flame we fled amazed their destined way they take and to laocoon and his children make and first around the tender boys they wind then with their sharpened fangs their limbs and bodies grind the wretched father running to their aid with pious haste but vain they next invade twice round his waist their winding volumes rolled and twice about his gasping throat they fold the priest thus doubly choked their crests divide and towering o'er his head in triumph ride with both his hands he labours at the knots his holy fillets the blue venom blots his roaring fills the flitting air around thus when an ox receives a glancing wound he breaks his bands the fatal altar flies and with loud bellowings breaks the yielding skies their tasks performed the serpents quit their prey and to the tower of pallas make their way couched at her feet they lie protected there by her large buckler and protended spear amazement seizes all the general cry proclaims laocoon justly doomed to die whose hand the will of pallas had withstood and dared to violate the sacred wood all vote to admit the steed that vows be paid and incense offered to the offended maid a spacious breach is made the town lies bare some hoisting levers some the wheels prepare and fasten to the horse's feet the rest with cables haul along the unwieldy beast each on his fellow for assistance calls at length the fatal fabric mounts the walls big with destruction boys with chaplets crowned and choirs of virgins sing and dance around thus raised aloft and then descending down it enters o'er our heads and threats the town o sacred city built by hands divine o valiant heroes of the trojan line four times he struck as oft the clashing sound of arms was heard and inward groans rebound yet mad with zeal and blinded with our fate we haul along the horse in solemn state then place the dire portent within the tower cassandra cried and cursed the unhappy hour foretold our fate but by the god's decree all heard and none believed the prophecy with branches we the fanes adorn and waste in jollity the day ordained to be the last meantime the rapid heavens rolled down the light and on the shaded ocean rushed the night our men secure nor guards nor sentries held but easy sleep their weary limbs compelled the grecians had embarked their naval powers from tenedos and sought our well-known shores safe under covert of the silent night 
and guided by the imperial galley's light when sinon favored by the partial gods unlocked the horse and oped his dark abodes restored to vital air our hidden foes who joyful from their long confinement rose tysander bold and sthenelus their guide and dire ulysses down the cable slide then thoas athamas and pyrrhus haste nor was the podalirian hero last nor injured menelaus nor the famed epeus who the fatal engine framed a nameless crowd succeed their forces join to invade the town oppressed with sleep and wine those few they find awake first meet their fate then to their fellows they unbar the gate twas in the dead of night when sleep repairs our bodies worn with toils our minds with cares when hector's ghost before my sight appears a bloody shroud he seemed and bathed in tears such as he was when by pelides slain thessalian coursers dragged him o'er the plain swollen were his feet as when the thongs were thrust through the board holes his body black with dust unlike that hector who returned from toils of war triumphant in achaean spoils or him who made the fainting greeks retire and launched against their navy phrygian fire his hair and beard stood stiffened with his gore and all the wounds he for his country bore now streamed afresh and with new purple ran i wept to see the visionary man and while my trance continued thus began o light of trojans and support of troy thy father's champion and thy country's joy o long expected by thy friends from whence art thou so late returned for our defence do we behold thee wearied as we are with length of labours and with toils of war after so many funerals of thy own art thou restored to thy declining town but say what wounds are these what new disgrace deforms the manly features of thy face to this the spectre no reply did frame but answered to the cause for which he came and groaning from the bottom of his breast this warning in these mournful words expressed o goddess born escape by timely flight the flames and horrors of this fatal night the foes already have possessed the wall troy nods from high and totters to her fall enough is paid to priam's royal name more than enough to duty and to fame if by a mortal hand my father's throne could be defended twas by mine alone now troy to thee commends her future state and gives her gods companions of thy fate from their assistance walls expect which wandering long at last thou shalt erect he said and brought me from their blessed abodes the venerable statues of the gods with ancient vesta from the sacred choir the wreaths and relics of the immortal fire now peals of shouts come thundering from afar cries threats and loud laments and mingled war the noise approaches though our palace stood aloof from streets encompassed with a wood louder and yet more loud i hear the alarms of human cries distinct and clashing arms fear broke my slumbers i no longer stay but mount the terrace thence the town survey and hearken what the frightful sounds convey thus when a flood of fire by wind is borne crackling it rolls and mows the standing corn or deluges descending on the plains sweep o'er the yellow year destroy the pains of labouring oxen and the peasants gains unroot the forest oaks and bear away flocks folds and trees and undistinguished prey the shepherd climbs the cliff and sees from far the wasteful ravage of the watery war then hector's faith was manifestly cleared and grecian frauds in open light appeared the palace of deiphobus ascends in smoky flames and catches on his friends ucalagon burns next the seas are bright with splendour not their own and shine with trojan light new clamours and new clangours now arise the sound of trumpets mixed with fighting cries with frenzy seized i run to meet the alarms resolved on death resolved to die in arms 
but first to gather friends with them to oppose if fortune favored and repel the foes spurred by my courage by my country fired with sense of honor and revenge inspired pantheus apollo's priest a sacred name had scaped the grecian swords and passed the flame with relics loaden to my doors he fled and by the hand his tender grandson led what hope o pantheus whither can we run where make a stand and what may yet be done scarce had i said when pantheus with a groan troy is no more and ilium was a town the fatal day the appointed hour is come when wrathful jove's irrevocable doom transfers the trojan state to grecian hands the fire consumes the town the foe commands and armed hosts an unexpected force break from the bowels of the fatal horse within the gates proud sinon throws about the flames and foes for entrance press without with thousand others whom i fear to name more than from argos or mycenae came to several posts their parties they divide some block the narrow streets some scour the wide the bold they kill the unwary they surprise who fights finds death and death finds him who flies the warders of the gate but scarce maintain the unequal combat and resist in vain i heard and heaven that well-born souls inspires prompts me through lifted swords and rising fires to run where clashing arms and clamour calls and rush undaunted to defend the walls ripheus and ephetus by my side engage for valour one renowned and one for age demos and hippanis by moonlight knew my motions and my mien and to my party drew with young coribus who by love was led to win renown and fair cassandra's bed and lately brought his troops to priam's aid forewarned in vain by the prophetic maid whom when i saw resolved in arms to fall and that one spirit animated all brave souls said i but brave alas in vain come finish what our cruel fates ordain you see the desperate state of our affairs and heaven's protecting powers are deaf to prayers the passive gods behold the greeks defile their temples and abandon to the spoil their own abodes we feeble few conspire to save a sinking town involved in fire then let us fall but fall amidst our foes despair of life the means of living shows so bold a speech encouraged their desire of death and added fuel to their fire as hungry wolves with raging appetite scour through the fields nor fear the stormy night their whelps at home expect the promised food and long to temper their dry chaps in blood so rushed we forth at once resolved to die resolved in death the last extremes to try we leave the narrow lanes behind and dare the unequal combat in the public square night was our friend our leader was despair what tongue can tell the slaughter of that night what eyes can weep the sorrows and affright an ancient and imperial city falls the streets are filled with frequent funerals houses and holy temples float in blood and hostile nations make a common flood not only trojans fall but in their turn the vanquished triumph and the victors mourn ours take new courage from despair and night confused the fortune is confused the fight all parts resound with tumults plaints and fears and grisly death in sundry shapes appears androgeos fell among us with his band who thought us grecians newly come to land from whence said he my friends this long delay you loiter while the spoils are borne away our ships are laden with the trojan store and you like truants come too late ashore he said but soon corrected his mistake found by the doubtful answers which we make amazed he would have shunned the unequal fight but we more numerous intercept his flight as when some peasant in a bushy brake has with unwary footing pressed a snake he starts aside astonished when he spies his rising crest blue neck and rolling eyes so from our arms surprised androgeos flies in vain for him and his we compassed round possessed with fear unknowing of the ground 
and of their lives an easy conquest found thus fortune on our first endeavor smiled Coribus then with youthful hopes beguiled swollen with success and a daring mind this new invention fatally designed my friends said he since fortune shows the way tis fit we should the auspicious guide obey for what has she these grecian arms bestowed but their destruction and the trojans good then change we shields and their devices bear let fraud supply the want of force in war they find us arms this said himself he dressed in dead androgeos' spoils his upper vest his painted buckler and his plumy crest thus rephaeus demos all the trojan train lay down their own attire and strip the slain mixed with the greeks we go with ill presage flattered with hopes to glut our greedy rage unknown assaulting whom we blindly meet and strew with grecian carcasses the street thus while their straggling parties we defeat some to the shore and safer ships retreat and some oppressed with more ignoble fear remount the hollow horse and pant in secret there End of section three.